everybody. It has been another month, so I, I do welcome all of you back. I again appreciate all of your efforts and your willingness to help us out on the building community. And uh, I'm not going to talk a whole lot. I am going to turn over to the team. And this is a brief overview, kind of a reminder since we last met. We continue to meet weekly, typically Tuesday morning, so unless something is happening, uh, like a most of day today, so we need to this morning. Uh, but anyways. Those weekly meetings are still very beneficial, uh, and I can't. I just want to go on the record yet again that I'm always impressed by SMA. Whenever there's any feedback and a reflection from sort of the internal folks, it seems like within the week, the feedback that I see in the, in the working plane design is, is immediate. So I really do appreciate it. You can listen, you can interpret it, and you allow your professional skills to make it happen. So I do thank you. Uh, with that said, I also just want to bring the full building committee up to speed. As we recall, last meeting we had, last building committee, we had a discussion around uh, mechanicals and what they would look like, some options. Uh, we thought it was in our best interest to create a little subcommittee. And uh, we had a subcommittee meeting a few weeks ago now. Uh, I think that was a very productive meeting, a lot of great input. And I think you'll see some of the results today. We'll probably talk about some of that as well. So that's what's been happening over the last month. Uh, without further ado, Helen, if you want to take over? Yeah, so this is showing maybe the existing 
marketplace. So this this is this is um, what will be in the schematic design package that the obviously much larger for the process meter to look at. So this is the detailed survey with um, topo and structures and other materials that they'll use as a baseline for costing. Um, this is um, the, the beginnings of the demo plan. We're going to make some refinements based upon our comments today of our limit of work that we anticipate um, on the site. Uh, this is this is um, the first shot schematic design 
possibly we can lower the building a little bit. It would make everything a bit better. Um, so for stormwater, we try to stay away from uh, catch basins and pipe systems, which are quite for cost reasons. Um, because Northampton regulations require not only uh, treatment of totally suspended solids, uh, but also phosphorus and nitrogen. And so the best way to treat phosphorus and nitrogen um, is with uh, surface, uh, with infiltration or bio retention areas, things that aren't green. If we, we go to a pipe system, we then have to send all the stormwater through uh, more uh, mechanical things like storm scepters for CF for so solids. But, uh, and these things, one way to treat phosphorus and nitrogen is with something called a jellyfish, which is a membrane, and so you send the water through there and it, it grabs the, the phosphorus and the nitrogen. And the problem with those things is they're really expensive. And we have to bring all this water to one place and then get rid of it again. So the, the, the thought process here is that we have three, and maybe now we can go to the next. Yeah. We have three uh, bioretention areas, which are um, shallow ponds a foot deep with uh, 30 inches of uh, really good engineered media, sand and gravel, and, creek, and, um, and then underneath, it, depending on the test pits, we're hoping that we have enough infiltration that we can put nothing underneath. If we need to, we might have to underdrain them. But we have plenty of grade to deal like the underdrains. So, um, uh, but we'd only expect it to infiltrate about six inches. So, the hole might be good. So, here we have one. So, the water coming down here is directed to this corner here and would flow into this one. <coughs> and they all have uh, drains, so they overtop into a drain before they go out to the road. And then this flow here would enter this one, and then the big service zone would enter this one. And then they all discharge here with level spreaders so that we continue the pattern of water out of the site. Um, so that takes care of, uh, of the quality of the water. And then we have the quantity uh, issue where we have to mimic, uh, we have to match existing peak flow off the site. And so um, we have 20 or 30,000 square feet of existing impervious area and in the existing, and then proposed will have about 10,000 square feet more. So that will create more runoff, and uh, the thought for that is to put in an underground system here, underground chambers, um, that, and take the roof water, which is clean. So that's nice to put that in an underground system because those are hard to maintain. So the roof water will be clean, which will reduce the need of maintenance. Um, and then we'll detain the water in there uh, to create the lowering of the peak flow off the site. Um, and then that, that will have a controlled outlet which will drain out here. And I guess the other thing we just learned about is that the, the geotechs are re, re, uh, recommending uh, a foundation, a good foundation drain. I mean, there would be one anyway. They're recommending what they're calling a perimeter drain. So we'll have a, an additional perimeter drain around the building. It will also stay like outside of these facilities, so that it's pretty, pretty obvious. How much area um, impacted by the construction in total? So it's between an acre and a half and two acres, depending on what we do. If all this is removed, I think it's going to be, I sized it before that, it was about 1.6. And with all that, I think it's one, two acres. Is there any um, variance that's great, granted for scholastic buildings or municipal buildings? Has there been any investigation of that? Or are the infiltration expectations uh, consistent across all buildings in the city regardless of type? Typically the city is pretty consistent um, even on single family residential projects. Um, we've had a numerous projects that have put in commercial size systems so he's very concerned about stormwater. Um, we could um, defer to, to, and to Craig, how, you know, and Craig and Andy, how they want to approach the city if they want to ask any more questions just to make sure that we've 
exhausted that. But there's probably going to be some asks, is this the one we want to make? So I did speak to Sarah LaValle, who does uh, oversee the stormwater in, in Northampton. Um, seems like a very reasonable person. Um, but it will, because it's over an acre, involve DPW permitting. So it's a twofold request. So we would need to talk with Sarah as well as the DPW and have some understanding of what they might be willing to forego. I don't know what that would be asked. I'm not sure where we would start with that ask, but I know that they'd be willing to talk to us. So another approach that we could investigate is the MVP, which is DOER funds. Um, it's a municipal vulnerability preparedness fund. And one of the prime concerns for the Western Mass, because we don't have any seawall needs, is to manage uh, uh, historically uh, precedented uh, rainfall events. So if we could say, hey, we're putting an even bigger one in, how will we use MVP funds to pay for it? And so address all of the stormwater retention using that particular source of funds from the city. The city is granted it, the school is not. So I have talked and I have spoken uh, to Doug McDonald at the DPW who reviews stormwater, mm -hmm. and um, uh, just briefly, and he knows of course this area. Mm -hmm. And there, there is an area up here where stormwater is eroding already, uh, the bank. So he knows about that. <laughs> I didn't talk about that. I said our project is over here, but uh, you know these are these are the new requirements, and they're they're trying the they're trying to reduce nitrogen and phosphorus in the runoff. And uh, these green filters are, are really uh, uh, good at that. This underground system will be placed in, in, a, in an area where we're filling anyway. So it will, it, it, that will make it easier to, to, uh, to site. Um, and um, uh, so it, it seems like uh, what, what our thought was that we would talk to Doug McDonald once we have more of a schematic design to see where where we can make some some concessions or you know how it's a tough little site it's very steep and uh, and it's a big uh, the building as Rachel said is is pretty wide so um, we're trying to make everything work. Um, my approach is twofold. One is to either ask for concessions or have a second proposal that exceeds expectations that they fund using MVP funds. So either way, it's going to be less expensive. The, the v, that's interesting about the MVP program. Um, my experience with it in the past is they're really in, interest, the state's really interested in tangible results now. So this project might be something that would kind of fit within that they fund, there's two part funding from what at least last I checked. There's the study phase and then there's implementation phase. Yep. Um, and so that that would be something to find out where they are in the, in the, in the grant award cycle and how that might tie into the project. A absolutely. I'm, I'm fairly certain that they've gone through the study phases. They've named a variety of needs, mm -hmm. invasive species, uh, uncharacteristic rainfalls. And so this could fall under that. You, you don't have to, in the study, say, and I'm concerned about that particular area in the city. You just vaguely say, oh. I'm worried about uh, atypical rainfalls, and so all culverts count. All infiltration areas count. Is that because of the kind of that push between the 100 and 500 year storm cycles, trying to figure out if, the, off, if shedding is actually doing what it should do? The, the, the funding is set aside to uh, mitigate the, the consequences of and causation of uh, uh, climate change. And so if we're getting bigger storms because climate change is, is creating that, then one of the approaches is to say, well, this is, you know, has to handle bigger uh, infiltration events. And so the proposal is, let's go super size or let's go super turbo big. Can we use MVV funds to, to pay for that? But again, if this isn't a high dollar item of the project, let's not make this our ask. Yeah, so the schematic design Cost will kind of help bring that conversation. If I'm right, DPW has the authority and will review the plans and may make comments. Yeah, and so um, I think I think one thing that's really helpful to think about with with the city and, and most municipalities in, in the state is 
the building inspector is the zoning enforcement officer for the municipality. So ultimately, we're going towards a building permit is where we're trying to get. And that enforcement officer, the building inspector, is going to say, yes, you got all the pre-development permits you needed. Yes, you met with the public if you needed to. Yes, you went to the Conservation Commission. You did all these. And your drawings comply with the code, and therefore, I'll give you a building permit. What we don't want to have happen is to go through the process, have a full bid set ready to go, ready to get the sign off from the building inspector, and have them say, oh, you needed to get a stormwater permit. You needed to do test bits. You needed to do these things. So um, the, gray, the gray area, what we've seen in the past is this process that we're, we, we're going through here as professionals. But again, I, there is a different relationship here between the town and the school, and I don't I think that's something that could be explored a little bit more. I just want to put some on the table. Maybe it doesn't matter, but I'm looking at this and I'm seeing the footprints getting larger. Um, John's proposal may be worthwhile in the long run because I don't know how this affects. The city plans to put a dog building in that lower corner of that drawing. We push the footprint out more if, if you know, then if, if they're going to bring in, and put that dog facility there <coughs> um, for the animal control officer, I, our, our project may start to cause problems on that project. It may be, unfortunately, we need to be planning together mm -hmm. in that corner as yeah. that footprint gets bigger. and. To John's point, having a bigger catchment area, they already take into account drainage that's going to come off that other facility when it gets built. Um, so there may be conversations with the, the city in long-term planning saying, we're building this now. You're looking to come in in a couple of years and put something in that, that lower corner of the, um, where you see the, uh, yeah, right down in there. Mm -hmm. that so I don't... I think, I think we need to be thinking about that. If this footprint and drainage gets larger, it probably needs to be planned in, in concert. That's I would agree. Point. Yeah. I mean, we could loop in Pat McCarthy at Central Services. I didn't even know where that building was going to go, so thanks yeah. for pointing it out. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, I think that would definitely be important if, in terms of stormwater and, and any other implications for the site for both facilities. Should yeah, be. Or, it, or it may make it, whatever we have to do there may make it impossible for that to actually be a viable site for the city anymore. Yeah, that's a really good point. I, I think you. what we're learning from this exercise is the footprint you see here in, in green is a, a balanced stormwater site in terms of the current regulations for mm -hmm. this building. So if you were to add another building to this complex, the stormwater footprint here only supports the horticulture building. It would not support animal science as designed. Um, and so if it were to come in later, it would not have space to meet the stormwater standards in this area. So we may have to go large well, somehow. I don't know. Uh, Lucy, I'm, Joe, I'm not sure that it's, I don't know what building you're yeah. considering for the animal what is it a, But the previous building. 1,100 square feet. Oh, the previous building they wanted to build, we did a feasibility mm -hmm. study over on, um, on the south side of that, of the park. Um, Anyway, in one other spot, we did a noise study. It was very yeah. large, and this and site, this, was, this site yeah. is not like. No, this this is a downsized know. building. But even it's, even here, I you know putting that yeah. building, that animal building. Sorry, it's it's would be, yeah, it's it's literally right here. Yeah, is the site that they're looking at. Joe, I know that I talked with Will about this a few weeks ago, just thinking that there might be some crossover opportunities. I was thinking about money, as much as land sharing, but how we might share site costs mm -hmm. for that. And um, I know that, is it Pat that I that Pat McCarthy, put yeah. me in contact with, said that they've just hired or are hiring their architect for this. So once they do that, my intent was to get that team to talk with but I think they're still, and are they still in the process of awarding? To be honest, I'm not sure the current state of it, but I know it was uh, delayed for a while just because they didn't have the money to build it. So. For things like water, uh, power getting down there, right? it would be nice to not have to carve up all of whatever was putting in in terms of ground improvement uh, in another year after yeah. everyone's done. Right? Yeah. You may not see it during schematic, but maybe by DP we can have some better information. Yeah. 
Are there more than one sites in the city being considered for this facility? Yeah. There's yeah. several. Um, <laughs> they come to us a few times, and that's yeah. the site that we've been talking about. Yeah. Um, but Will's right. It was sort of was the pause button was hit. The funding that they had wasn't nearly enough to build it, and that's what we're finding out about this particular project. Uh, I know Tim Smith has been talking to the city about our property up by the VA hospital, that it may make more sense. Right. Uh, that's right. I heard that too. I don't know if that's getting any groundswell or not. But, uh, so I really think it's one of those two sites. I think it was, you know, it was an agreement in theory prior to the fire, so <laughs> it may change everything on that site. Right. But it's a good point. We should share this with the town at some point to let them know the intent in case they have some other plan that we're not aware of. Just a, literally just thinking right now, as we continue to expand uh, to deal with the stormwater, uh, if we take down the horticulture building, I know we've talked about it, I know we've talked about outdoor learning area, but could that potentially be a spot for the animal control facility? Yeah. So that they're not stepping on our toes as far as all of our construction. It's a little bit higher grade, because so they're going to have to pump all their water up right. a steeper hill. Yeah. It might be easier for them. Like, well, you, you know, they might be able to pay for a little utility prep work, so it's there. But I think they're a little far, what, far away for that yet. I don't yeah. know if money was even in the ballpark. I'm not sure I would solve tomorrow's problems that we don't actually know the constraints of. I think we should stay on target with what our needs are. And if we take a bigger than needed approach, that may help the building permit and it may help the funding stream. And I think we should stay on target with what we know we've got. So is this still a balanced site or are we looking more um, export? We're actually looking at more fill um, with the 228.5 elevation of the finish floor. Um, also coming out of the geotech report, uh, was a description of the existing soils on site um, that are not suitable for underneath the building or pavements. They're okay for landscape areas. Um, so it, we, couldn't, we couldn't reuse any, even if we had a balanced site, we couldn't reuse that fill underneath the building anyway. Um, so we are going to have to bring in structural fill for the building at least and possibly some of the paving areas. Right. So definitely the, the under the asphalt, the 12 inches would be base course. But yeah, they are, they're saying they, they uh, did some sampling of the on-site soils and determined that they were too fine and um, they wouldn't be able to compact them properly for structural fills. But they also had a, a statement in there that when uh, that, that was a bit preliminary that it's possible that they could be used you know, not right under the slab, but maybe uh, some for some sort of fill. So, um, so yeah, we are definitely in a uh, fill situation. So, not removing anything to fill. We're filling above natural grade, or are we going to have to remove certain unsuitable material to bring? Surely, you have to take the topsoil off. You can't build on top topsoil. Top so, so you're going to have some export. Is what I'm thinking. Well, they'll reuse the topsoil. Mm -hmm. They'll stockpile the topsoil. Oh, that's been and, tested. And then, Seems uh, usable. Um, I think they did. Did they do environmental? I don't. Think we, uh, we know we have. We're waiting on the phase one. Oh, yet, so. okay. Um, and, and then of course they'll remove all the the, the existing parking lots and uh, so and they they um, and then the the existing silty sandy material that's there. Um, they can reuse to build a lot of these features, not in the bottoms of them. Are you obliged to do a phase one? Sorry? Are you obliged to do a phase one? No, I'm doing a limited one, no. Yeah, careful what you ask for. Well, there's <laughs> two reasons I have to do it. Okay. One I know of. If you have to, then you have one to. I, one I guess might be there. Okay. But for taking down E building, we do need to do it. Okay. Believe me, I don't, <laughs> I don't like asking for anything that's environmental, but limited and it's not creating any concerns for us. Okay. So, thanks for that. But I was thinking as for material might be able to be left on campus too. I mean, just looking at, you know, bigger picture, can we leave it on campus? Uh, can it be reused? So, so. And it, especially if you're removing all those buildings too, 
uh, building E. Then there'll be then some that could be your backfill. Right. Mm -hmm. If we end up removing building E, whatever, assuming it's nice to <coughs> issues, could some of that fill be used underneath the new horticulture building? Would that be the appropriate <coughs> structural? Still under, under, under E. They'd have to do a, a sieve analysis. Yeah. Yeah. So are we um, now looking at removing building E as we start this project and not keeping it to the end? Not no, at the start. No. Well, just no, we can't, can't, can't put it underneath. It fills, out of the, fills out of the question if, it's the, if it comes down after the building's built. Right. That would be my preference educationally yeah. when we look at... Yeah. Be able to continuity of services for students. Right. We have to limit the impact. The fill would probably be stock stuff on the right hand at a later date. Yeah. But you'd be using that building to help right through to the occupancy or close. Can't building. put it under okay. the new building. You still use it. Right. right. That's why I, when you said that, I'm like, um, did I yeah. miss something? <laughs> I didn't tell you about the trailer. <laughs> I checked my notes, just FYI, as of May, I was told that the mayor was considering another site for the animal control building in addition to this one, so it's not set in stone that it'll be on campus yet, so just FYI, I agree, we should focus on your yeah. needs and then... Um, yeah, but relationship-wise, they, they have to know. Yeah, 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 absolutely. I mean, if obviously, if there's overlap between the projects, I'll try to make do my best to connect you with that architect, and um, Joe, maybe, maybe we could have a meeting with Pat you and I to just make sure we're all on the same page and update the committee as needed. Yeah, probably Andy, but yeah. Oh yeah, sounds good. So um, a couple of meetings ago, I believe we were still thinking about different finished floor elevations, and we had already prepared this. Um, this um, version at 229, but um, as Lucy had said, we're now looking at <laughs> um, we're looking at very close to this at 228.5. So we just thought it it bore um, repeating. Uh, but this was an animated um, walk around. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm just no. sort of out in the field of it. Oh, there we go. Oh, thank you. Wow. Thanks, Matt. Oh, it's a little <laughs> stoppy starty. It's a nice elevation. I mean, there was something to be said for this elevation being up higher anyway, so yeah. it's, I think it's a positive outcome, right? Is that? What I'm looking at maybe too soon is like a slope sidewalk type of surface. Is that what you're getting, how you're getting down to accessible? Yeah, 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 exactly. Okay. So the, the slope sidewalk that's parallel to the access drive. Okay. No issue getting that grade um, no. at that. That's what's oh. setting the building so oh, okay. high. Because I know yeah. that they can be challenging sometimes for upside sidewalks. Yeah. yeah, exactly. You're right. <laughs> we're just under. Of course, if the building exists already, you can work on it. We're at a slope that does not require handrails and ramps. Okay, good. Or in the designation of path or walkway. Okay. What's the elevation difference from the bottom of the doors where the building is to where it, if you come out about 20 feet? What's the elevation difference there? Is that flat or? What is it? In that in the service area? Yeah, the, yeah. It's in, the, a, it's, in this area it's right in here, mm -hmm. after they, when they back out yeah. of the doors with a piece of equipment, how yeah. much of a drop off is there going to be there? Well, it's quite flat. It's it's a little bit under two percent. Under two percent for how long? Uh, at least fifty feet. And fifty then, feet? Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> I assume this is early, early rendering. I just think of how many bird strikes are gonna be on that uh, cupola at the top and how expensive that glass is going to be up there and how attractive that is to lacrosse balls. Oh. I'm you certain that it will, <laughs> I did, yeah. <laughs> it, I, I'm certain that things will change in due course, but mm -hmm. it seems like that would be sited with perhaps some windows for illumination and, and whatnot, but that's not a particularly energy efficient strategy 
nor is it the least expensive approach. Mm -hmm. I was thinking down the road that it could turn into a uh, cupola with a compass on it and it could be more New England-esque. Still have metal siding on it versus windows. Depending on if that's meant for daylighting purposes, maybe we can. But um, I know originally it had that climbing structure involved, and mm -hmm. that has is evolving. So maybe it's something that could be changed. I think after uh, schematic design um, estimating, we'll, we'll all be sitting back down and talking about these elements for sure. Yeah. Can you just go here, Helen? Sure. Right. Um, and you want to talk from there <laughs> in terms of the, um, just providing an update on the uh, building floor plan? Yeah, so no, no dramatic changes from where we were uh, previously. There were refinements that we made <coughs> in certain areas already based off the feedback that we got here, um, based off the feedback that we um, had with the discussion with Desi as well. Um, we spoke with Dave Edmonds and with Bennett and Desi. Um, to oversee the Chapter 74 programs, uh, just to get some feedback on some of the topics that we were talking about. Um, so maybe to start off in the bottom right-hand corner, uh, we talked last meeting at, at length about um, so the depth of those drive-in bays uh, that we had in the Ag Equipment Repair Shop. Um, and in what we've done is exactly what we talked about in terms of um, pulling out the compressor room as well, the storage area that was there. So we have one bay that's fully, um, I think, 30 feet deep um, coming in. So that provides all the clearances that we're looking for around the piece of equipment, the, the deepest pieces of equipment, um, as well as some additional depth to the adjacent bay. We went from three bays overall to two, uh, but we did widen the doors um, so that we have two 14-foot doors. We thought we we talked about a 12-foot or a 14-foot, but. 14 feet um, I think is also a good safe way to go and there's a third 14 foot bay that's also into the horticulture shop as well so we have some consistency in terms of those over sectional doors. Um, in, in terms of where that displaced program went then um, those are really where we got into discussions with Desi. Um, one is that we are now proposing um, some loft storage space up above the other uh, storage rooms that are down below sort of at the northern end of the shop spaces. Um, and above the offices as well. Um, we got a little bit of feedback from them in terms of how we can access those. We're showing some alternating tread ladder, uh, which are similar to a ship's ladder, but they're actually a little bit easier to navigate. <laughs> Not as easy to navigate as a normal set of stairs going up there, but we believe we have a code compliance path there to get that to work. We need to talk with the building official to make sure that they're on board. Um, that's what the folks from DESE really ended up saying. They will defer to the building official in terms of providing it. But, um, it's a little bit more efficient in terms of providing access up to those storage areas. We know that those storage areas are not going to be regularly accessed on a daily basis. So that's, that's part of the thinking about how we want to just right size the amount of space that we're taking to access them. So if we're going up a, a like a built-in ladder, what what's being stored up there that can be brought down via a built-in ladder? Surely it can't weigh very much, It'd be very bulky. So wreath making kits, I think we talked about um, FFA, um, uniforms, it, it's sort of the lighter, lighter types of things. Yeah, there's, there's no sort of like boom crane or something that we're planning on uh, lifting up uh, heavier items. Uh, so it, it, it is limitation um, in terms of what we get up there. In terms of the access, we can certainly run out a scenario for a full access stair as well to sort of see what it takes up as a footprint and sort of what the cost benefit is of providing some additional accessibility to it. We're still at that point. Could we, I mean, like, it sounds particular. Could we put, like, a, like a tractor or, like, a trailer winch on the ceiling and with a basket? Just to sort of lift it up, like, outside of a barn or something, yeah. It, is that code compliant? I have no idea. I don't think there's anything that is not, like, you, you, you wouldn't be putting people, you'd be putting goods and materials yeah. in that to bring it up and down. Well, It'd just be OSHA, right? <laughs> <laughs> kids Mark James, is there anything that you think you would have to access a system like that? Or we're just talking well, about light I, storage. So. Again, it depends on what we have for other storage. There's things that are going to have to go up there that you're not going to carry. I mean, some of the kids will try and carry it up the ladder like this. Right, right, right. But if we had some sort of system to pull up something that like held 50 of, pounds maybe are you talking like a set of stairs like at home depot that is on wheels and is an actual 
No, it's there. It's really like being flush with the wall. Are you talking like a library ladder? So it, it's okay. a fixed, fixed steel ladder, um, so no movement in the ladder itself. It's just the, the treads alternate as you go up, so it's a little bit okay. easier to navigate than it is sort of a, a ship's ladder that might be used for It's, it's, it's vertical. It's, there's no... No, no, there's an angle to it. Oh, there is. Oh, okay. to it. Okay. It's similar to what angles. your students will be climbing when they're actually out on an HVAC site, you know, up on the roof somewhere, okay. moving Perfect. stuff. This is... Did you put your pots oh, okay. and other planting material up there, possibly? Well, I mean, that stuff ideally would be with the head house. We would have to be moving it to those spaces, but things that would have to do uh, with dealing with equipment. I mean, there is no tool crib in there for all the, our tools and stuff that need to be used to fix the equipment. Um, I don't know if the three foot space was added on the right side wall, but if not, we would have to put cases of oil, um, parts of stuff up top on there in the, the middle off. one we would need to put things that would have to do with our projects i mean the the reef stuff could go up there but again it's a lot of shuttling around of things um yeah i i mean is there a possibility of that like home depot style set of stairs that's on wheels and locks and moves i mean that I'm trying to think what's safe for students or staff to go up or down i don't that might be what they're using in industry for certain things or accessing roofs. I don't know. Which what makes a lot of sense in this scenario. What about exterior stairs, like a fire escape set of stairs on the outside of the building so you can access it and then go in? Is there any value? Does it doesn't change the footprint? It'd be a whole lot less fun for you. I think you're creating. Is it a stair? We'd have to create a catwalk. Does it have to be covered or does it yeah. have to be yeah. covered? And then we'd have to create a catwalk to get to that because it's interior. You're talking on the interior of the building? Right. Yes. Yeah. So so Moving the stairs sounds like a great idea, but they do take up real estate if they're just sitting there. So you would have to have a place to be able to tuck it away. Yeah, so there is the uh, authority having jurisdiction that needs to be consulted with on this. Um, but again, for costing purposes, we wanted to. We knew ladder was not the right way to go because things were going to be, you know, you need your mm -hmm. hands mm -hmm. to move things up and down. Yeah. The assumption was light storage. We know storage is an issue. For, I mean, I think the what you're describing will work for the most part. Mm -hmm. If there's some things that are a little bit heavier, a little bit bigger and awkward, yeah. if you had something that, just a platform lift that you could pull up on a chain mm -hmm. that stayed up, not down, mm -hmm. um, that would work. <laughs> to take something that would hold like 50 pounds or something, but we would have to make sure that it was secure so students couldn't get up there and try to lift each other. <laughs> Small enough basket, they can't fit it. I mean, but that can be locked out and whatnot, but right. um, most of what we would probably go up there would be able, you know, someone like Chris could easily hold it on a shoulder or under an arm and climb up, but if they want to have two hands, require two hands to climb up then yeah. you're going to need something to lift. I can put a chain fall there for a pretty reasonable price too. Right. If you're carrying to get things up. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. so yeah. safety yeah. has to be there. Absolutely. Right. So you guess what will happen, it'll happen. Right. Yeah. You safety have to tie off, there'll be a safety um, device as you go up the ladder, which will be a good thing also to get familiar mm -hmm. with in terms of how it's used. And we can easily lock out the chain. If it was a, a chain lift where you're mm -hmm. Pulling it up, we could easily just lock it, and we have the key, not the kids. Yeah. And, and this will sort of um, play into a lot of the subsequent discussion that we're talking about. Mm -hmm. But um, we have produced a set of construction estimating documents that are depicting one one set of um, design decisions as we move forward. Yeah. There's nothing precluding us from giving the cost estimator some alternatives, so we can price out a full stair as well. So when we come back and talk about the estimate in general, that can be an option that we come back and revisit. And hopefully maybe we have the opportunity to talk with the building official between now and then and understand sort of from their perspective, um, are there any no-goes in terms of how we approach this? So yeah, I, I just want to add, I think if, if the storage is seasonality, right, so if we're, they're, they're taking stuff out, putting it into an existing, if there's a different storage below, right, that material is getting tra traded out for, and it had, you have a platform lift, it makes more sense mm -hmm. in, in that respect that it's going to come down in an event and trade it out, and then it's there for a month or however long it's needed, and then it's traded, you know, depending. But there, there'll definitely be um, limitations to what we can trade in and out and have up there. Isn't it like a shipping container or like a small wooden building on skids? So 
mobile, permit friendly, isn't that going to be so much more appealing than having to climb upstairs to grandma's attic to get the stuff out of the, the high high? I think the struggle for us is the storage space that attaches to that workspace houses things you use every day to service things mm -hmm. like a floor jack that's on wheels and there isn't a place for some of those items now we have you know wall space for cabinetry to secure flammable stuff and um, that's just trying to put that in our brain it's not a place we would store seasonal things right doesn't mean we couldn't use that storage space for seasonal things because there isn't storage space in the building you know there's a you had a storage space on the floor which would have been great for a tool crib now i don't see any storage space that for a tool crib um like you said that would be using every day tool so, crib could be a mobile craftsman tool well we have a lot of things that wouldn't necessarily go in that okay we have multiple tools like we actually had a room we walked into that was full of stuff that um, room off the head house no it was in the back garage okay. you didn't get a chance to see it <laughs> <laughs> so let me get this straight you're saying this space doesn't allow you room for your equipment besides the big equipment to go in there not equipment it's the tools sure. to repair yeah yeah that's what i'm getting at okay so you need an area so where there's a bench, not there's metal storage. Well, I, I know benches were going to be on the left-hand side of that room. And yes, on the wall, we could probably attach uh, some of the, the snap-on toolboxes that we have for screwdrivers and wrenches and stuff. But what about the bigger items? Where's the, where's the bench or grinder going to be stored? Where's the, the, the drills, the saws, the... All of that stuff. Some of it was on the wall, but we had cabinets in there that was holding a bunch of the smaller stuff. So Where are those there. cabinets going to go? Where's the floor jack going to go? Where are the extension cords going to go? Where are all the things that we use every day? Right, so the tool crib that we had we removed because at the last meeting we we agreed that we wanted a deeper bay. Yeah, correct. So we got rid of the tool crib <laughs> so we could store the larger equipment. equipment. Again, at the end of the day, I think what we're looking at is going to be too expensive. So I just, I'm asking both of you, push comes to shove, what is more important? The tool crib or a deeper bed? I know you want both, but if we had to choose one, I'm just asking both of you who are using it every day, what's more important? I mean, the tool cribs in the other shops are about anywhere between 5 by 8, 10 by 8. That's what you're looking for? Something that... Yeah, it was That's tiny. basically what it was. It was small. I think you had a, I think I want to say it was probably five by eight. If that, the space yeah. That you had. yeah. yeah. It might have been like six by six. Yeah. You guys but, have about 10 feet from the assumption of she looking for 40 square feet there to that wall. So that could still be used yeah. as a tool area. It's an alcove. Um, it just depends on how often you're storing the larger equipment in that bag. You're looking for 40 square feet basically that you can secure separate right. from the other stuff. Put a, um, a cage up in the alcove if it's big enough and create a tool shelf. Tool but then you can the never shelf. bring the big equipment in. Well, so we why, need 25 why? feet to fit the truck. So what about the left hand side? And if we, we need to, to one garage bag. I mean, the other thing that we can think about is whether or not we can steal some sure. of this space sure. here. Or, um, widen it down and introduce Is that just workbenches? Or can some of that space in this area? Well, the, the middle is a different space than the right side. The middle space is the project space. We really can't take away from that because we're going to put our sandboxes in there. We have to have certain size. Okay. Um, the right one... I would not want to take out and have just one bay because we need to at least get two pieces of equipment in there to be able to work on them. We were hoping to shoehorn a third in. Well, right. Helen, the outposts for the doorways themselves leading into the bays, is that because of door swing and exit? Coming out, they they can't be swinging into the hallway. Yeah, the door can't open into the hallway. Yeah, so yeah. 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 question. Clear. 
could you take the space that you originally had for the compressor and the tool crib and just put that outside like you did the tool crib? I mean the compressor. Build, build this a little bit larger over here. Right. So if you made it, it doesn't need to be heated, our tools don't need to be warm. But if you had it this bigger here and had a door at this end to go in, um, or one to go in one bigger space, however you want to do it, we could have the tool crib down out here where most of the stuff we have doesn't need to be heated and we can go in and out of there. Because most of the tools we will use could be attached to the wall because they're smaller cabinets, but it's the bigger items that really can. We'll take up floor space that needs it somewhere to go. But it is, I know we talked about, you talked about having a three foot perimeter around each piece of equipment, so you're looking at 31 feet, at least for the truck, to have three and three. And this is how deep? 30. 30, yeah. So we're one foot short already. We had to, like, 25 feet, right? Yeah. Right, so if that's only 30 feet deep, yeah. it, we have five feet to walk around. Correct. So if we were to put that tool crib along that wall, we would reduce that even more, which more the safety than anything else. It, there's nothing precluding us from doing exactly what you're talking about, Mark, aside from the fact that it is, we're technically going to make the building bigger by doing that. Right. It's a more cost-effective construction to build that little appendage off to the side than sort of a full-blown version of the building, but right. it will make the building bigger. You, you can see we haven't changed the number, the overall total square footage, because we're assuming that a compressor room is going to be sort of a, a shed-like gotcha. type of construction versus okay. full-fledged. Yeah, about right here. What's the width of this correlate to a vehicle size? In, so in the horticulture shop, the, the size of the shop is driven by the number of project areas that you can get laid out. Um, I think it was 10 by 12 is what you guys do currently. Um, we need six of them. Six right? 10 by 12 spaces. Right. So it, they fit in there right now, it's, it's a little tight. I mean, the other option is we could think about, well, does a 10 by 10 project area, could that be viable and then, and then Craig is talking about, I mean, could you get something here, or could you get something in between and sort of use some of that space? That that might be an option we could look at. It, it feels like this is a multi-million dollar project, and we're quarreling over how big to make the shed roof on the side, that it's going to be very cheap per square foot. Yeah, I think on the outside is the, is the, is the smartest way. No compromises out there? Like the whole idea is safety and functionality. Why are we saying, like, you need 10 by 12? Can you deal with 10 by 10 instead? Like, that's the core of what you do. It's John, like saying, I think can you... we are, John. I think that's what yeah, you're No, doing. no, I, I, I support your idea. Like, put it yeah. on the outside. It makes all the sense in the world. So I was recruiting the academics and the safety. That seems crazy with a $6 million project. Totally go with your idea. Just call it cold storage. Yeah. Unconditioned storage. Yeah. Yeah. Because, you know, a lot of that stuff doesn't need to stay warm when it's just sitting there. Yeah, it'll be cold on the hands when the kids pull it in. But. No, but there also may be a prefab option that just, I was just thinking right. placed on a slab. Yep. Yeah. I mean, there could be, like we did with the the, um, the uh, freezer that we added on the outside of the building here. There could be other cheaper options. So well, there I think that makes the most sense. Yeah. Yeah. You buy that yeah. sit on a pad. It could even be a Connex that's attached. There could be some... Something that's but really having access effect. from inside instead of going out and yeah. around would yeah. be okay. yeah. Yeah. absolutely. No, I think that makes the most sense. <clears throat> we can certainly have the cost estimator work up something on yeah. that so we know what the value of it is. Mm -hmm. What are we talking about for size? I'm sorry. What are we talking about for size? Okay. Our old was probably six by six, little tight, but what's the width of that compressor room now? Probably eight. eight. So eight by ten. Eight by ten would be plenty. It's perfect. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Probably square it off, right? Put the whole side of the building over there. We'll design it, right? <laughs> 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 right. This is not the same as that. We heard that. That was the last one. Yeah. But you do change the title. So let's talk just real quickly about the compressor room now um, in terms of the location of that. That was the other piece that got pushed out. It was the other piece that we talked through with Desi as well, because the decibel level of what the, the compressor generates is something that is of concern, needs to be OSHA compliant um, in terms of where it's located. They strongly recommended that we position it outside the footprint of the space, 
not just for sort of initial occupancy, but they were, um, and they have experience from other facilities as well, where it becomes a long-term nuisance. Um, if we were trying to build it inside, and you can hear it at the office, you can hear it in the classrooms when it's yeah. going on. Um, so it's shifted out um, per their recommendation. We're, we're suggesting it gets built with a CMU backup around it just to provide acoustic um, robustness around the perimeter. So that's the reason why it, it came out. Um, I know we talked it, about it being potentially out here, um, and we talked about it potentially being in the corner here in between the greenhouse and the, the main building. Uh, we talked about that location with Desi, and their, their concern there um, was really just the proximity to the greenhouse construction itself. Um, and the fact that the greenhouse is, a, is inherently a less robust enclosure, um, and so they're more concerned about the noise here emanating in both directions, both to the greenhouse and the shop, versus here where it could become a little bit more isolated. Now, so, this compressor room, is it fully enclosed, or is it open air? It's enclosed. Okay. Yep. And it's unconditioned? Uncon unconditioned, correct. Yeah. Okay. How big is the greenhouse? It looks like it's 50 by 25. Is that the current? Greenhouse size? Yeah, this is what, what's shown here is it's matching the existing greenhouse. Uh, we'll talk about the greenhouse in a second in terms of what we're going to estimate in terms of cost options. Um, but that it gave us some flexibility. We know that the size is the size you guys are familiar with it, um, but probably could be bigger. But we were also running into some site constraints in terms of considering it making it longer um, in terms of the road coming around. So whether or not it was wider or not, we're sort of working with that existing uh, So. Compressor room. Um, only other updates I think we made were really tied to um, some feedback that we got from Mark and James about sort of maybe some of the, the more fine tuned adjustments of, say, the head house. Um, we previously had two entry points, um, or sort of an entry and exit point, that were open to the hallway. Um, we elected to um, reduce it to a single um, entry point, widened it though, and uh, located the existing floral coolers, they'll get relocated to the new building here so that when you come in the front door, um, there's sort of a display opportunity right there. This is the relocated desk. Um, so we still have sort of a lobby condition for any uh, potential retail customers that come in there. Um, still maintaining the same sort of flexibility and functionality size of the head house. It seems welcoming for open house and, and visitors as well. Yeah, I think it's, it still has a, a good level of comfort to it as you come in the main entrance. Um, we right-sized the, <coughs> right the number of lockers uh, to get an overall 60 count. Um, and um, there were some modifications that we made in terms of the, um, the visibility of the windows into both the, um, the simulator room as well as the office space, all sort of based on some fine-tuned comments. So that, that was the majority of the updates that are being made. Um, again, not, not dramatic. Yeah. And we're still showing a fire pump and a fire pump room. So we're showing a water room. Um, okay. did, that's a good point, though, Helen. We did complete the hydrant flow test. We confirmed we do not need a fire pump for this building. Um, it wasn't really expected, but good to have the hydraulic calculations to back that up. Um, we'll still need a water room for the domestic water coming in. I think we're showing right now non-potable water as well for the greenhouse. Whether or not we definitely need a, a separate non-potable people, we'll, we'll figure that out just to sort of look at the number of backflow preventers and things that we need inside the building for equipment. Okay. Um, any other comments on floor plan? Um, and just a reminder, this is still schematic design. We'll continue to refine it with your input. Um, it will only keep getting better. You know. So, cool. on the greenhouse, did you say you're going to use the existing size footprint? We're going to use the existing size footprint, which gives us options in terms of how we're thinking about it and what we're going to cost out in terms of the greenhouse okay. itself. Whether or not we can relocate the existing one, um, and we'll look at sort of what the costs of that are versus buying a new one that matches the existing. Yeah, okay. Um, even if we relocate, or sorry, even if we do new, um, speaking with the greenhouse uh, manufacturer that provided the controls that you have now, we'll be able to salvage those controls that are newer. Um, so there'll be some savings in terms of just starting directly from scratch. Um, they've suggested some improvements as well in terms of some shades and things that we can talk about whether or not they're desired from your end, but we are looking at still those two options. Okay, I just want to make sure it's so that the hydroponic systems would actually fit and have a wide enough aisle in the middle. So that's another reason to sort of match what you have right yep. now is that we're not modifying that, assuming that it works, right? Correct. Yes, it does. 
So I have, a, I have a question that I'm just having a hard time seeing. So if I'm looking at this sort of big shed roof to the south and yeah. then a drop down. If I'm in this classroom here, is there sort of a low ceiling for here and then the ceiling jumps up because the inbound light with those sort of vertical upper windows are all on? I'm just trying to imagine like what's the room feel going to be because it's not going to be a drop ceiling, I assume, right? Well, actually, it is. I'm glad you pointed out the windows, John, because there's been a change there. At one point, we were talking about high windows. I think when we actually came for the very first working group that were sort of clear a story along there. But that was assuming that we were using part of that wall as a retaining wall. And so we had earth sort of burned up against the side of the building. With the revised grading, we almost have a um, sort of level condition all the way around. So we'll be able to do quote unquote normal height windows through there so you're not looking up and out. You actually have a view out towards the side of the field. <coughs> and the ceiling that comes I'm through. Talking about these these windows that are way up high. So those are at the um, above the roof. Of yeah, so the, the high, flat roof. So the high clerestory is actually going to be coming across here. So that lets light down into the shops. Uh -huh. okay. um, so there will be a drop, a conventional drop ceiling throughout the entirety of both the hallway, where a lot of the mechanical equipment and services are going to run, as well as the classroom okay. spaces. It would be more, more sort of familiar, typical type of classroom environment. That's distracting. So the windows along the football field are going to be more lower, you're They're saying? They're going to be lower, right? So we'll have to talk about whether we're putting something on them to go back to the ball strike. I was just um, going to say, are they going to be bulletproof? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we, can, we can look at either how we glaze them or we can look at putting something on the exterior. But if we put something on the exterior, that can go counter to the notion of trying to use it as an emergency egress path as well, so there's some trade-offs considerations to make there. That fence along that side goes higher. From a security standpoint, are there any issues with classrooms not having exterior exits? So I think what we heard from sort of campus-wide is that the move was not to necessarily <coughs> doors directly from the classrooms, which we generally don't design new buildings anyway, but rather to have windows that have the so ability to open up. You can up see the one on the other side of them. So yeah, it says emergency exit right there. So mm -hmm. it has a, a handle, it open, the entire glass opens on a handle. Okay. Yeah. We also have communicating doors between each Right, so, so that yeah. in a lockdown yeah. situation where it didn't, we got that input from their security. It does add another point of security failure by adding more doors. Mm -hmm. Do all the doors need to be like zappy to get in? Mm -hmm. Like, is, is that a thing that you need to have? That. Yeah. So next year, yeah. just the exterior doors. Right. That's, that's what okay, but like garage doors, are they, are they different? No, no. So those are those can be there's wide a, open. But yeah, what about the another, there's another. What we're doing is think of it as you're trying to harden the exterior, and then you're you're being able to in an emergency close those garage bay doors, and the building is immediately secure. Is there an element of risk? Yeah, just like anywhere in life. So yeah, when the doors are open, you. Okay. Decrease the like, yeah. But you don't have to put them on the interior doors if the garage doors don't have them. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Um, so, where we are in the project, um, we've already actually sent off um, the architectural, um, mechanical, electrical, plumbing, and fire protection, some of it. Uh, to our cost estimator uh, end of day this past Friday. So um, they're, they're underway. Um, as I mentioned before, Lucy and Rachel have been waiting on the survey, so they've, they've done their catching up and we're gonna send um, site work and site drawings off tomorrow, uh, as well as some additional um, information and cost estimator regarding alternate costs that we'd like to see, uh, see them put numbers to. So the full estimate should be ready at the end of the month. Uh, that's 9:29, um, and we should. We did want to talk about the plan for review. We will have a regular working group, our Tuesday morning meeting, right after that. Be able to get a peek at the numbers, see what they look like, um, breathe deeply, <laughs> do any value engineering, um, or start that process. And um, we think it will likely require a building committee meeting you know before the, the regular one just in terms of how the timing has worked out with cost estimating um, you know we're, we're throwing out 1010 as a possibility um, and then as we've been sort of alluding to throughout the presentation um, 
We've gotten lots of, lots of inputs and a desire to explore other options, which at SD is a great thing to send over to the cost estimator. So um, certainly mechanical systems, and um, we'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. The structural system, from the get-go, we've been discussing uh, a fully CLT, cross-laminated timber plus glue limbs structural system. But we recognize you know, there might be pieces of the building that um, might be more effective or efficient to keep as traditional steel framing. So we've got three, three options there, fully CLT, partially CLT, and fully steel because we want to see what that cost differential is. Uh, exterior cladding, we've gotten input, um, again, both from this group as well as the working group. Metal panel, um, fiber cement board pre-painted, and um, natural wood. So we will get those costed out. Demolition scenarios, I think we have a slide on that. How far do we go with removing what's left of building E? Um, green roof or no green roof, we understand operationally it's not desired. However, they, there may be trade-offs with uh, some of the stormwater treatment. Um, so we thought it would be useful to get, um, get a number on that um, and working with BDG uh, in terms of trade-offs, um, you know, what that could look like. Again, not an intensive but an extensive roof and not to be inhabited. Um, greenhouse options, um, Matt can talk a little bit about that, as well as um, mechanical system options related to the greenhouse. So, I guess you can go or I go. <laughs> it might be more effective if you do. So, as Andy had mentioned, we had met with some of you um, uh, about three weeks ago um, at the end of August um, to really talk through the, the um, mechanical system options. We uh, started the discussion looking at six options. We came away from the discussion with three options, which are the three that our um, cost estimator will be costing um, all electric system. Um, again, we started with three of those and we, we um, came down to one. Um, there's certainly um, a lot of interest in geothermal. We've got that. Uh, re retained here, and as well as a biomass option, which John has kind of uh, provided some additional detail on. So, pros and cons have not been updated. I don't know if you're looking at that, John. Um, this was taken directly from the matrix that we had presented at that meeting. Um, and again, we're looking at the three options to be costed. Um, Do you have one of these hard sheets available tonight? Yeah, but it's quite, it's teeny tiny. So I, I know that... Um, well, this, this was from the working group. They take the right to six options mm -hmm. that were in today's package. I'd like to see that. Now, so John did a lot of legwork in regards to um, promoting the biomass, or correct me on the proper term. And I'm confused on terms of sustainability and carbonization. And even if something's all electric, there's a carbon, a carbon source somewhere that it's be, being burnt at the plant, okay? Not maybe made, say, local. Um, I would think on a facility like this and a Dina school, sustainability would be more of a driving factor. Can you elaborate in some way? Well, first I want to say this, the matrix has not been updated yet. So when we get the numbers back from the estimators, our team will be doing life cycle cost analyses. So, again, um, anything that was issued, and I know the print is quite small on this, has not been updated based on the inputs we've gotten from the group. Um, so, and then to the uh, bigger question, carbonization and um, priorities. Right. So I, th I think we're obviously concerned with sort of the embodied carbon, the operational carbon um, of the building. This is more operational carbon that we're talking about. Um, there's, there's implications um, for all the systems, and, and yes, the systems that are electrically driven, whether it's an air source heat pump or whether it's a ground source heat pump, that electricity is coming from a mix of renewable energy and it's coming from a mix of fossil bur burning um, energy as well. Um, over time, the, the grids are going to be greener. Um, there's going to be more renewable energy in the makeup um, as we move forward. That's just what energy codes are pushing us. It's all what for um, municipal um, investment efforts are pushing as well. So we do have to make that assumption that the, that the grid is going to get greener over time. It's not going to stay static as it is today. 
Um, at the same time, um, the, the, the carbon implications of the, the biomass system, um, yes, we are um, we're burning wood to be able to, to uh, fuel that, um, but there are some, um, there are some good renewable um, sources there as well in terms of the wood that is, is being generated. So um, it, it's not that there's, I think, one bad system and one good system in terms of what we're looking at. We're going to be looking at the carbon implications as well um, when we generate the life cycle cost analysis. Um, it's not necessarily just going to be dollars based. Um, it's, and we're getting a lot of good feedback and input in terms of what sort of the, the eventual outcome of, of all the systems are going to be. So it's not, it, I know there's, there's different perspectives certainly on the different fuels in terms of how we're looking at them, um, but, but it's something that we're going to provide some analysis on moving forward. To clarify, I guess what I've heard you say, both say is the life cycle cost analysis. But, but I, it sounded like the question was the life cycle carbon analysis. Right, so we're going to do both. Okay. Yeah. I, I, I agree that the grid will green, but the, the challenge that that presents is bigger than we could possibly imagine. That to meet the Commonwealth's goals, not New England's goals, the Commonwealth's goals, there has to be 100 acres of solar deployed every week for the next 27 years. That's that's what the goal is. So the goal is to be carbon neutral by 2050, and that's what that looks like. And while I think that is meritorious and something we should look to do, the reality is 15% of New England's electricity last year was renewable, and then we were burning trash. And so I, I think we are fooling ourselves to say that the grid will green. I think by the time this new building is decommissioned, it will be sufficiently green to merit key on that I, I just the timelines aren't lining. That's that's what troubles me is that the scale of the decarbonization is going to slow that. It's just going to be incredibly daunting for our society to decarbonize. And so I, I just feel like we have to be realistic that an E supported system is at best fifty percent renewable. So I think those are great points. And I think there's the other thing that we've talked about is the fact that um, any of the electrically driven systems, um, the air source heat pump more so than the ground source heat pump, becomes extremely inefficient when the weather gets very cold in the dead of winter. Um, so we're potentially thinking about systems that are going to have a pretty high operational cost regardless of the, the green um, aspects of it. So two things to sort of counter that or sort of at least address it. One is that there's the potential of thinking about a uh, biomass system um, for either the greenhouse and or the main building as sort of a, a backup system or something that can be used um, for uh, those extreme temperature uh, heating days that we're going to have because um, it's more efficient. There will be a cost there because we're building a redundant system in some ways, but there may be some um, some capital available in terms of funding that from a donation perspective that um, we might be able to get our hands on in terms of thinking about it. So we are going to think about, okay, what are those two systems if we can build in that redundancy um, from a biomass standpoint. The other thing to keep in mind is just the fact that we are still thinking about the notion of a large photovoltaic system on the roof. Um, so we'll have the ability to generate on-site solar. Unfortunately, it's going to be less effective um, at the same time that you have that great heating need. So. Um, it's better. Than, it's going to function better for cooling and sort of heating on the intermediate uh, types of days. Do we have a sense of how? Five percent. Sorry. Are you still thinking eighty-five percent of the usage when you were talking last week? So we should be able to get to hundred percent in terms of the usage. So the eighty-five percent will be on the steep slope roof, the metal slope roof, in terms of the PV capacity that we have there. But if we um, proceed with thinking about PV on the lower roof, the flat roof over the classrooms as well, we should be able to easily get to the hundred percent. Capacity again when it's not covered by snow. Um, so we have to think about sort of when sort of the peak generation opportunity is there and sort of the peak need as well. They may not align. Air source heat pumps do a great job when it's not that cold. Right. I've never had one that doesn't require some sort of backup heat in New England. Yep. Um, so. it, it's almost like air source heat pumps do a marvelous job to get you to the Thanksgiving vacation. Well, they're the belt state. Heating systems, DC, yep. metro, those areas, great. Up here, they have challenges sometimes. Yep. Depends on the building too, and the exposure of the building to wind as well. If we're in a pocket, 
it yeah. would be easier, but still challenging. Um, truly, there's insulation required in the building. Mm -hmm. um, I would propose that another uh, uh, MVP ask could be if you wish to uh, over insulate the building. Could that be deemed as a, a way to mitigate climate change causation by using less energy for this building? Would that be an ask that these funds could be squinted at and availed for? Aren't the stretch codes where they show 40 for walls, I think? I'm just thinking you know, to go beyond 40 could get, you start talking about Depth. larger you know, wall cavities. But yeah. still, there's money to be had and ways to do it. In, in truth, I'm not so much worried about the building because I imagine the building is going to require about 50 to 75 BW to, to heat. It's the, the greenhouse, and that's going to be 50 by itself. The greenhouse is only 10% of the footprint, but I, I am quite concerned that it's going to be 30 plus percent of the heat load. Hmm. This is no insulation whatsoever. Very true. Can I interrupt here for a sec? Mm -hmm. Are there any questions for me because I have to leave? You use the greenhouse in the winter? <laughs> yes. It's all year? All year? Well, in the summertime we don't, but we start in September and we end in June. Okay. So just to give you a sense, maybe Mark, this is something. You might want to stay for this <laughs> conversation. Okay, I got a couple minutes. Okay, he's got a couple minutes. So what we've asked the cost estimator to look at is pricing a, a variety of scenarios in terms of demolition of the existing building. I think baseline without any question will be taking down the foundations of the portion where the fire has destroyed the building, right? So that will be cut off and removed um, as, as included in all options, um, just so everyone has a starting point. Beyond that, we're actually going to look at um, preserving some two different scenarios in terms of what remains. Um, one, we've heard that there is sort of potential high value to maintaining the garage space. Um, maybe not necessarily tied to the horticultural program, but sort of to be used um, elsewhere um, on the campus. I think Kim has some potential uses for um, a garage if we can preserve that. So that's that yellow space in the bottom left-hand corner. Um, so the, the challenge there is um, you can picture or imagine trying to peel away different areas of the remaining portions of building E. We then have to reclad whatever remains. So there's some work involved there if that's going to be um, the approach taken. Uh, but we want to understand sort of what that represented from a, what, what represents that from a monetary standpoint. Isn't that in the middle of what was going to be sort of that green <laughs> yes. traffic yes. island? Yes, that, uh, another downside yes. of it uh, in terms of affecting the larger vision of what's there. But again, just to understand what that represents. Um, we'd also have the sort of power needs of whatever is left there. Currently, we're thinking of using um, electrical capacity to feed, feed the new building E um, from the existing transformer and panels. Um, so to look at what it means to have this building online with the new building E, we'll have to evaluate that as well. But again, just understanding it from a demo standpoint. The other. Um, the other aspects that we're looking at keeping is whether or not the existing headhouse and classroom and greenhouse would remain um, as one scenario as well. Um, what those would get used at is a little bit up in the, or used for is a little bit up in the air. Um, there was, again, the potential scenario thrown out there of do we keep the greenhouse and headhouse located up here and not build a new greenhouse on the, on the new building? completely less than ideal from an operational educational standpoint because it means that you're bifurcating the, the program into two separate buildings. But I think the thought, I think the thought was to, um, again, just look at making um, the, the project viable from an economic standpoint in any number of different ways, even if it's a compromised one from an educational standpoint. So um, we're going to look at it, um, but we can come back and we'll talk about sort of what the again, cost benefit is of not building a new greenhouse, keeping the one that's there, leaving the existing headhouse and, and sort of separating out those programs. You have more space because you have more classrooms here with keeping this one and sort of and still building the same amount that we're talking about, but um, separated. So. Um, just so everyone's aware of what we're asking for costs on. Uh, it's not that we're making a decision that way. It's really we're just getting options as part of this a la carte menu. So with this, I don't know anything about the existing building. Would it be a significant renovation to make it a useful greenhouse and headhouse? 
potentially. Um, again, it, it all just comes down to the, to the funding of it. We could look at a scenario that renovates it. We could look at a scenario that just clads the back of it so it's not looking at sort of the burnt, cut off end of a building anymore. I'm just thinking about budget phasing. The, the greenhouse is something that can pretty easily be stuck on to our new building in the future. Mm -hmm. Correct. If we needed to use the space we've got for a while. Is there a code compliance issue with touching the old building? Does it have to be brought up to code because it's getting modified? Um, it, it comes down to the dollar threshold of what we'd be spending on it um, as a percentage of the full and fair cash value of that building. Okay. Um, so we have to do a little bit of, I think it's a fair question. Um, I don't have the full answer on that piece of it yet. Back in the day, there was a 700 gallon number two oil tank. It never leaked, ever. <laughs> <laughs> it's no longer there. Um, but that's about as much as we know about it. So until I get the phase one back, those demo ideas will probably have to take another pass after we see what's there. But yep. there is something that there was something there in the back. Big L Apple dilemma. How how big is the implication of leaving or taking on the stormwater and the drainage of the new building? How much does that affect? I think the design took into account that disappearing. Is there any impact? Yeah, if you're in area, right? Yeah. Maybe you'll have to have more um, site permits for that building. So at some point, there'll be a discussion about the cost. If that tenant has an issue, what the cost is, and then a comparison against what would you do? You might encase it. There's ways around it. Until right. we know for certain, uh, I'm going to hope it's. Yeah, it would change the stormwater caps too. So it would be more impervious service to consider. Yeah, it all actually I can appreciate the strategy of trying to manage expectations and costs, but it's hard for me to see a greenhouse that's already perhaps approaching the end of its functional life and a head house that has, you know, very tired wood paneling on the inside of it. And we're building a six million dollar building plus probably, and yet we're still using the broken tools that are pretty core to this educational uh, uh, project. It just doesn't make sense to me. It, it, I, I get it. it. We have to explore all sensible approaches, but that just doesn't feel right to me. I think the concern is that the building comes in at ten million. Yep. And we only have six. Yeah. yeah. Do we have? Do we pause and now look at these options, or do we look at all this ahead of time? And try to have a debate. Yeah. Yep. And how many students is this getting spec for? Sixty? Is that is that necessary? We made that assumption early on that the that the shop is going to grow. It, I mean, is that a thing that needs to get revisited? If it comes at ten, do we shrink everything down and just make it a building to accommodate the existing number of students? I, I would like to see it grow from an industry standpoint. I think it makes all the sense in the world. But is it a per student? Is that even a linear uh, retraction? Probably not. Probably not. Yeah. Or will that space be used for cross training activities somewhere down the road and you need an extra classroom so you have one to use? Yep. I don't know if that's the bottom. Okay. The equipment takes up a lot more space than the kids. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right. <laughs> yep. And, and kids are scattered, they're everywhere. <laughs> uh, retaining that equipment storage building feels like a better use of our compromise than retaining that greenhouse. It just doesn't feel right. Yeah, so the, the greenhouse was rebuilt green five years ago, so I think that's part of it. it yeah, that has to get taken into account, too. So. And I think it's going to be like it's gonna we bring be out a greenhouse specialist, someone we've been talking to, or someone else. Mm -hmm. After schematic, we look at that, and we get a final decision from someone. Is this movable or not? What's the risk? What's the cost? Mm -hmm. and then we can judge it against whether we build something new or not. Or maybe we can sell the old one or something. <laughs> and they're really used greenhouses. There's, I mean, as I drive down through um, various sill towns, there's a lot of closed greenhouse shops that have closed over the years. You never know. Or maybe a farm. Yeah, I don't, think, want to go I don't think any of us want this to be the, the first option.
I had two questions for you guys. <laughs> sure. When will you do soil testing where the oil tank was? Is that scheduled soon? It will be scheduled once we know that there's a history or some documents that show what was done. Okay. Once that's either shown or not, then we would have to do testing. So there's no time frame on it, but before we get into DD design documents, we would have that information. And, and they do some soil sort of testing. And the second question is the foundation that's remaining from the part that burned. Does that need to be removed anytime soon for us to start progressing with the new building? The reason I ask is we've been trying to schedule when we'll transplant anything we want to keep <laughs> um, from that courtyard space and like take up that <coughs> patio. But right now, you know, kids still utilize it. You know, so it's a little less of a, you know, it's a little more appealing to the eye right now the way it is um, until we start to decimate and dig it up. But, but those materials, some of them will reuse. Mm -hmm. So I'm just trying to schedule if it's not going to happen until like next fall, then we would leave it. If it's going to be like early next spring and groundbreaking, fall is kind of additional, ideal time to transplant stuff. Um, but ideally, I'd like to be able to do it with kids when they can use equipment. So I've been struggling on hoping that gets resolved too so that students can. Where were you thinking of transplanting? Like around campus or not? I'm not really sure yet where it would yeah. be out of the way. <clears throat> yeah, that's um, hard to say. So I think all of the not a final. Tr yeah, what you mean is it's not going to be in a final. Yeah, it's going to be a temporary. It's going to be a temporary. It's a temporary home. Probably raised bed area. Yeah. I would say probably want to keep it where it is as long as you can, and you need to look at the, the construction schedule. Okay. I mean, any demo would be done, you know, at the end of let's say the twenty twenty five school year. Because like right, where the oil tank is, the where the oil tank was, we built a circular patio above it. Uh -huh. So I, I don't know if it's just a simple sink, you know, like a three inch drill hole, take a soil sample or for someone coming in and you know, tearing everything up. To Are the plants black and hanging over? <laughs> <laughs> then you're probably good. No, they're growing really well, actually. Uh -huh. <laughs> I'd say you have until spring at least uh, before any work's going to take place anywhere okay. in that vicinity. Um, you want to take the, the cement pad out too while you're at it, that would be great. That would save some money. Because <laughs> that's part of the process, right? We're talking about demoing that old area. So again, if there's things that we can do in internally that can save some money. Which that demo pad could be used as underlayment, as Phil. Yeah, especially for doing some road work. Um, when you send this to your cost uh, uh, calculators, are you asking them to look at uh, putting heat in the floor? That was a thing that was discussed during the mechanical uh, subcommittee. Is that in, in the yeah. cost packing now? Yeah, so that's how we're, especially with the geothermal, yep. um, we're Playing on heating, not through unit heaters, but through radiant flooring. I think okay. we, we suggested it only going through the entirety of the building, not just the shops, just because it's more efficient to get yep. below where yep. users are. Um, and it ties in well with the geothermal system. And you said there's a wet room for water, like potable water and a hot water tank for the room? Yes. <laughs> so now we have a board meeting at 5, and one of the agenda items for the board meeting is this particular discussion and a potential vote for the trustees. I just want to Craig, to take a moment and talk to the building committee about these two options, get your input, so then we have, I think, a more informed decision and recommendation for this evening's meeting. So, Craig, if you want to walk us through what we're looking at? Sure, Andy, thank you. So, uh, this is for the procurement of construction services we're talking about at this point in time. Um, the Commonwealth has several different required um, procurement processes for construction. One is called Mass General Law 149, which Everyone kind of knows this design bid build. Your standard, you design it, you put it out the bid, you get the number, and in the Massachusetts, low bid is qualified bid is who would be selected. Um, the other option is what's called the construction manager at risk. And basically, what you're doing is giving the contractor the ability to go out, find subcontractors, develop what they would call a general, a guaranteed maximum price, 
um, and it would be an open book process where the first one, you don't see anything. You have no idea what the overhead and profit is. You have no idea what the markups are. And it's very hard to negotiate change orders or change credits back after the fact. Um, and it's, it's a longer process. So I'll just go through the 149. So design, bid, build uses lump sum. It's closed book, meaning you don't get to see what happens behind the scenes um, with the finances. It's a multi-step process. We, you, the owner, have to hire all of the subcontractors first, or should I say, qualified subcontractors first. So you are actually putting out bids for 18 different trades, interviewing those individuals, scoring them, and then coming up with a short list. Um, can you assign that? Can you have a, effectively GC do that on that so you don't have to do it It's super? 149A. So that's the, the second piece. So right. And it might be one of the reasons we would do that. So it's it's heavy on, on time. So you're going to interview maybe 50 subcontractors possibly. Well, no, I, that's not true, Craig. All the sub-bidders have to be pre-qualified by DCAM. Well, they have to meet DCAM qualifications. They have to meet DCAM qualifications mm -hmm. and they're appropriately able to bid the project. We will not be interviewing these sub excuse me, sub bidders. We will be reviewing the bids and selecting the appropriate responsible low bidder. Well, the GC will be doing that in their general bid. I think you're painting a, a little different picture than what I'm familiar with. Um, and I don't believe there would be 18 filed sub-bids. Could you list all the 18 filed sub-bids? Demo. No, demo's not a file sub-bid. I'm sorry, sub uh, abatement. Abatement. Uh, no. Carpentry. No. No. Abatement's not necessarily a file sub-bid. It is listed yeah. on 149, yeah. and it does at a certain threshold, and I think the threshold is... We may have some so miscellaneous <coughs> iron work, iron metals and iron was one question I had. Miscellaneous metals. Well, do we have that value as a cap? So we, mm -hmm. we're probably not going to hit. We don't have masonry. Oh, we have a little bit of masonry now in this project with the compressor room. So it's, it won't be all. Right. So let's let's not get so bogged down, down in this. But go ahead, Craig. Continue with your rough. So the the idea is that the owner does select a qualified subbid. They list those filed sub-bids, then they go and advertise for the primary contractor, which would be the general contractor in our world. At that point in time, those 18 filed sub-bids, or how many there are for the project, get transferred to the primary sub-bid. That person then picks from that list and includes that group of filed sub-bids into their number, and that's what they use to bid. What we're doing is the owner qualifies this process so that the has the opportunity to disqualify certain subcontractors. There are certain subcontractors that you may not want to use. There are many subcontractors who are just not qualified for the work. This gives you the opportunity to make sure that those do and that the general contractor isn't just picking their buddy down the street because it's the low bid. Mm -hmm. I have a question about, so DCAM was brought up as qualified, must be qualified. There's going to have some hinky bits to this building, whether it be CLT construction or greenhouse. If DCAM doesn't have a greenhouse builder approved, because no one's built a big enough greenhouse to meet DCAM thresholds, or they've done enough of them to meet DCAM thresholds, how do we approach that? How do we, how do we the enable The general that? bidder will have to deal with that. Yeah, so in, in option one, yeah, but option two, if we're the, I, I'm just naive on how this works. It, option two, where it's sort of open book, is that the, the, the file sub bids are, are some of the work that has to be pre bid before the general bid, generally two weeks before the bids are assembled, and then the general bidder selects who he wishes to use it as a file sub bidder. Generally, the low bidder, unless for some reason, the, the low, the filed sub bidder can restrict a general bidder from using their number also, mm -hmm. okay? And so in that process, <laughs> it's, it's complicated, but it's not so complicated. I, I think they both have their pros and cons, but I think we need to let 
Craig, give his speed up so we can move on. Because we do have a board meeting. Ultimately, it's not going to be a problem if DCAM doesn't have a greenhouse manufacturer. Exactly. So I, I, all I'm worried yes. about is yes. make so, sure that yes. we can still have these yes. things. So yes. the process is, is that either DCAM will have a certified greenhouse uh, contractor or they'll have a prime contractor who has done green, greenhouse work, but as long as they get DCAM certification for that work, I bet there isn't such a contractor. That's what uh, I'm getting at. I'm not sure. Guys, sorry, we said to move on. Yeah, yeah you move on. But um, so time consuming. Well, we have to do it. So time consuming. The bid doesn't come out until the bid comes out. So if we don't bid this until January or February, and the number comes out three times higher than we can afford, we're starting kind of from scratch and going back. <coughs> because we don't know the cost of this, we don't know how much we may change in this project going forward. A CM at risk gives you the opportunity to move a little bit more flexibly. Uh, I'm not saying that construction manager at risk is the end all or be all to delivery, but for this project, it gives you a guaranteed maximum price with an open book, so you get to see everything the contractor is doing in pricing. You get to help choose subcontractors in some cases, at least if you have contractors on your staff or work that you want to do work, they will think of that. It also shortens the overall project timeline. You're not having to advertise for 18 subheads and then a prime contractor. You're going out for one CM at risk. So you're qualifying three or four folks. You are then having them go out and start doing pre-construction work. And it allows you to get these early packages that everyone's going to want to hear about. So foundation, site work, steel, anything that has an issue with, with time or shortages, you can do early packages. So the, sub, the contractor can actually buy out the foundation package before you even need the rest of the, the, the plans themselves. So as you're building and you need to spend money on the uncertain funds that are out there that have to be spent by 2025, you'd be able to build the foundation, still have that done, pay for it under those funds, and then keep moving with your fundraising. It would give you the opportunity to keep moving. It wouldn't be static where you would have to stop, if that makes sense. Yes. May I, I'm going to offer a counterpoint. Uh, as, as someone who's been involved in multiple DCAM projects, I, I often find, however, I've, I've never been involved in a, a CM at risk DCAM project because um, I think they're a little unusual. Uh, you know, most of our projects are designed bid build. The ones that are CM at risk usually have this really good sales pitch and it doesn't come true. Uh, I usually find that. Um, you know, we don't want to be involved in the contractor's books. We want them to manage those. Uh, and and we don't want to be involved with what they're talking about with their subs. Uh, it usually gets really messy for the client to be involved in those. I find all too often that the, um, the contractor ends up thinking that it's their job to take on a lot of design. And, and we here have hired a very strong design team and so in some projects, you, you do push some of the design fee onto the, the contractor, the CM at risk, and so you're not having to pay for that. But in this case, when we already have that team on board, there's something really to be said for the design they've built. When, that, when they issue that package, it's going to be really solid. Mm -hmm. And so um, I would strongly, uh, I, I would like to give that strong argument for the design they built. Um, part of the challenge that I have with this for helping the school is spending $3.1 million of grant monies by June of 2024 with another million or 600 by 2025 where that money disappears. So I'm looking at it from the standpoint, can we afford to lose the $3 million and if the design bid bill comes in over what we all hope it does. That have we lost too much time then and does the, the funding become at, at jeopardy? I, I'm just asking the yeah. question. And that might be a gut check as well because then we don't want to be in the situation of not having the money but having authorized three million worth of work 
you know, a $3 million foundation yeah. for a 7 or $10 million building that we can't put on that foundation. Yeah. So in some ways it can be a gut check if you get that number back and it's much bigger than you thought. Yeah. Well, I'm leaning towards what Tom's saying, but also the benefit of construction manager at risk is they're going to be developing budget pricing along the way also, okay. which would be a check against the, what these guys are doing with their, mm -hmm. their budgets along the way, like the first round being schematic design, the next round would be DB. Mm -hmm. Okay, so <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of balls up in the air, and I'm not convinced on either way which to go. To be honest with you, and I, I would like to. they do both have advantages. That's for sure. I just want to put forth just as strongly the argument for design build build. I've done both. They both are are fine um, if done correctly and everyone is on the same page. Um, my concern more is about the funding source, and if we can get the funding source pushed out, that takes some of the risk away. Well, that's away. a valid point, Craig. You, you're bringing up a great point about the funding sources. Yeah, I just, you know, if, if no, everyone's willing to job. accept that's it, then maybe, <laughs> maybe we should consider the, it's going to cost more money. Let's be honest, it's three to five percent more money, so if you're building you know, $2 million, you could see another $150,000 on that, on top of it. What do you get? You get the market value of this contractor, whomever is hired or qualified to tell you costs, shortages, material issues, what they're buying for now. Um, I happened to have a contractor come out and just look at the site the other day who had done cross laminated and steel in the last year. And um, he had some great thoughts about um, how to get things built quicker, but he's obviously not going to share that until we get further along. Um, On the other hand, sometimes that can be a contractor who says, "I know, I know, I've been on steel." But now steel's not available, and I'm a CM at risk. I, I, I'm not really on the hook for this. We got to find something else. And you say, "What? This is this is steel building risk." In design build, build you say, "You said it would be steel mm -hmm. by October." <coughs> In that contract negotiation document, making sure that we have our Thank you. logistics covered and what we need covered it's, is. I'm just saying contract. that sometimes you, you thought it was going to cut out delay and sometimes it actually opens the door to delay. Mm -hmm. Gentlemen, we have to wrap this up. I'm yeah. sorry, you're going to sit in that chair right now. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, everyone. <laughs>